you know, when you talk about weight loss, you really talk about weight release because you work holistically in a much better way than a lot of pseudo diet programs and clinics and uh, which really have pathetic programs where you start, you learn a little bit about food, you, do, you count calories, and then you're right back to zero. So the more we understand about what happens in our body and what, what food is really supposed to do, because <laughs> we are all emotional eaters. I don't know how that happened, because a long time ago, you know, we all came out of Ethiopia, we were nomads, we traveled where there were foods, and we ate a lot when there was some, and then we could sustain on that, and we stored it. And we kind of think now, because food is available 24 hours a day, that that's what we're supposed to do. So there is a lot of self-image problems. What, what we really should look like. And we see, you know, constantly ads on TV. I think every five minutes it's something about weight loss. So we're all starting to think, you know, how should we really look? And what, what is our real rela relationship to food? And, you know, and sometimes it goes overboard. Sometimes it goes serious. And we have bulimia, we have anorexia. To our institute comes a lot of people that have gone that serious. And of course, it's very psychological, it's a lot of trauma, it's, um, you know, PTSD, it's post-traumatic stress, it's sexual trauma, there's a lot of things that lead to that. But I think the more we understand, especially about fats, and that is something that has been interest of, for me a long time now. And I talk about fats and everybody's like, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> Never heard this before. There is things like white fat and brown fat. There's, you know about cholesterol and you know about the good fats and the bad fats. And you know about triglycerides and you know about sugar. You know, you hear about all these things. But how does it really, how's the synergy in your body, and how do we need it, and what does it have to do with your immune system? So, suddenly now, you realize that the immune system is totally dependent on how I eat and what I do, my exercise. So I started off in Sweden, and I remember the first time we had somebody who was morbidly obese and, um, you know, in America, a third of Americans are obese and 5% um, are morbidly obese. In UK, studies shown a fourth are obese and 2% morbidly obese. Well, the first time that somebody came with that, because in, in old days, Swedes, they didn't park the car right by mall. We didn't have malls. <laughs> we didn't park, you know, we usually walked, or we, we were not so dependent on that. Now, if you go into any supermarket, a lot of people need scooters. So suddenly, scooters is a big, big, uh, big, big need. And I see it everywhere I go now. And, you know, we've, we really are so dependent on on cars, scooters, wheelchairs. This, I have seen that that's increased the last five years. It just took off. So obviously, we have degenerated a lot re re recently. So the first time this man came, and he was very young, he was about 25, and he was probably 300, 400 pounds. And by the time he left, and it took a few months, but the time we left, I stood in one of his legs, of his old pants, and he stood in the other <laughs> side. <laughs> and we took pictures, and we had every magazine that wanted to come, come and take pictures, because this was like news, like, wow, how did he get so fat and so big? Because it's not just fat, sugar is the biggest culprit of all of this. So, and now children, the last 30 years, this is the heartbreak, because the last 30 years, children have tripled in obesity. So now children are about 20%. And, you know, children are malnourished. That is a global uh, health problem now. And if you're malnourished, 
And if you are obese, you're heading for problems. Of course, diabetes is the first, but cardiovascular and cancer. So, and there is many things that blocks the growth of good health and good brain health, even for an infant. You know, first we were supposed to have mother's milk with all the nourishment, good cholesterol, and you have everything in that mother's milk so that you can digest all the foods. There are enzymes, there are proteins, you know, there are vitamins, there are minerals. So instead, like both uh, me and my husband were brought up on um, formula. And formula doesn't have anywhere near. You cannot compare it. So you're starting life with uh, poor nutrition. And then it kind of goes on. I get the question all the time. When should my child start eating? He's three months old. Yeah, how many teeth does he have? Okay, none. <laughs> so if you don't have teeth, and I mean, if you have one tooth at six months or eight months, you have three teeth, do you think you're ready? No. It's a, it's a developing uh, time that I need to have milks. I have to have fluids that will feed me. I can't eat solids. And then most of us were brought up on um, maybe oatmeal. As soon as we had one tooth, we got oatmeal. <laughs> and parents in, in, uh, my, in my parents' time were told, give them cereal before they go to sleep, and they will sleep all night. Yeah, because we had to digest all night. <laughs> so <laughs> we were just so stressed. We started life stressed, you know. So, uh, you know, for children's sake, we need to learn as parents what should we feed them and where should they get the nourishment and where does fat and dairy, oh, I mean, where, where does fat and calcium comes from? Where does protein comes from? And, okay, how do I do this? Let's go to the next. I'll do it here then. No? Okay, well, we'll go to the next. So, now, stresses like we don't sleep enough, we don't exercise enough, we, uh, you know, <laughs> We've been uh, nourished of food that um, multi the multinational corporations, more or less, took over our food supply. And, you know, they're not going to worry about nourishment. So that's going to be low nourishment. That's going to be high sugar. What they did so that things could uh, sit on, sh on shelves forever so that they didn't get rancid or spoil, they took fat and, and fiber out of everything, and they added sugar. So we're all sugar addicts. So we've been on sugar for so many years through our sodas, through our bread, our bakery, and it's just been constant. Now, we produce 20% more food in US, uh, or overall for the world's population, that's seven, seven and a half billion, right? We produce 20% more. In U.S., we throw away 40%. Every day, we throw away a ton of food. Imagine this. So it's, uh, you know, and what is it that we waste? Is it really nutritious food that we waste? Yes, a lot of that is grains. A lot of that is beans. A lot of that is foods that could have been sprouted, seeds, nuts, grains, and beans that could have been sprouted. You know, whenever you germinate a seed, nut, grain, and bean, you really get 10 times more nourishment than you started with. And it really goes back to frequency. It really goes back to the energy. You know, everything in uh, our universe have energy. We would not be in this world if there, if, if there wasn't energy. And you know, the sun, the, 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 the world spins around the sun, and you know, there's constant energy. Why shouldn't I eat food that gives me energy? When I cook something, I denature the whole thing. When I cook, for example, meat, that the meat and dairy industry, you know, in the early 1900s, about 100 years ago at least, took this upon themselves to teach all of us that protein comes from meat. Well, meat, fish, dairy, and um, 
and uh, chickens and you name it, pork. That's where we get our protein from. And calcium, yeah, that was from milk. So when you realize, for example, if you ate arugula, how many of you ate arugula today? It has five times more calcium than dairy. Okay? So you can't compare what you get in vegetable sources to what you get in animal sources. And once you cook meat, pork, fish, you denature the protein. It's not a complete protein. And you know, you're looking for vitamins like B12, which is so important for the whole neurological system. It's gone. So there actually is one bacteria, they call it usually B12 vitamins, but it actually is a bacteria that we all need to take. And it works on our whole neurological system, and that's B12. But you have to find a good bacterial source, plant source. And, um, you know, it's gone. So we always thought, well, meaning meat, fish, having milk, cheese, the way I was brought up. So I got interested in early, and, um, you know, I started at 18 year old uh, in this field. At 15, I became vegan and more or less fumbled into. Uh, this health um, um, deal, yeah, um, the, the health um, movement where when you change lifestyle, you can change what's been given to you in many ways. So people would come, let's say, with asthma, and they've been told it's just going to get worse and worse, and you have more and more medication, and this is going to be that's your future. It's not going to go away. And then, after a few weeks or a few months, they were out walking with me, taking long walks, going up and down stairs, and slowly but surely releasing their medications. And a lot of that medication was um, anti-inflammatory, steroids, and these have so much side effects that they're treating themselves for one disease and ending up with many more problems, like osteoporosis, inflammations, and seeing people with arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and, you know, gout that they've been having, like, every so often, a few times a year, never to have, to have them again, and realizing that we've been railroaded, that we, this is the lifestyle we've all kind of was put on, because they took over our food sources because especially after the, um, the um, change in the Industrial Revolution and that we moved into cities. And now if we came from farms and we had everything we needed and we grew probably a lot of wild plants and plants and had very good source of nourishment, we came into the city, we had to buy what was available. So that's really when things went wrong. So there's so many, so many things that is going to um, hinder our development. And yes, and we are more obese than ever. And, you know, children are the worst hit. And now what they find is that they, um, they actually might live five years late, less than we do. That's how much we have degenerated the system. If you really look into it, it takes three generations to change a system. And we are really here. We're probably on the fourth. <laughs> and it will take three generations to generate good health again so that they can live a long, healthy life. But that's not where we are right now. So, so it takes for all of us to work in this together and forget pressures on how we're supposed to look. Why we want to look like that is a totally different thing. So we look, we look at things holistic. It's much easier because we all have been emotional eaters. And if I look at myself and say, I want to release some pounds, but why do I have these pounds? Is it stress? I didn't sleep enough? Did I exercise? You know, did I really move? Because if I eat a certain amount, I have to use a certain amount. I mean, there's pure math. I can't just eat a ton and not use a ton. It always have to be. So, you know, a big, big part of that is um, 
the organs in our body that uh, regulates our fat levels, and you have your liver. Then you have your gallbladder. Gallbladder makes bile. And you need good fat for the bile to be created and secreted. So, because bile, if you have your liver here on the right side, right under you have this avocado pocket size gallbladder, and then you have bile ducts that goes into the small intestine, and that bile is sitting in that gallbladder. You make a, a quart every day from the liver, stored here in the gallbladder, poured into the small intestine, and that's where you, uh, that's where you actually digest fat and cholesterol. So I need good fat for that even to happen. I need good fat for everything. So now when you're looking at where do I really get that fat from, because now you hear about white fat and brown fat, and there is a difference here. We were born with brown fat that kept us warm. You see those little infants, they hardly need any clothes, and they're just keeping warm. And so that is their protection, and we have it, but it kind of decreases as time goes by, and then we start making more white fat. And white fat is very, very important. It's our energy source. It, it uh, supports every cell in your body and the membranes. But then goes time, and we start getting into the food sources that we can choose, like in school. Now I can have bakery and chocolate and sodas, and now I start to make a lot of white fat. And when, it, when it's too much, I store it, and I mainly store it here. <laughs> you know, some stores here, some here, but mainly it's stored here. And it was supposed to be a little storage here in the belly, in the abdomen, because liver is right here, and the liver is the one who is supposed to take this when it's needed. So let's say I worked all day and I didn't have time to eat. I still have energy because I can use that. But now it goes into obesity, and I'm having far too much than what I ever, ever will need. That's when it starts being a problem, because the difference, for example, brown fat even looks brown because it's loaded with iron, and it has lots of mitochondria. You know what mitochondria is? It's the energy source in every cell in your body. And white fat, they'll have much less of that. So it doesn't have as much iron, it doesn't have as much mitochondria, so it's white. We want to have more brown fat. You know why? White fat stores fat, and brown fat uses it. It burns calories. So when I exercise, I make more brown fat. There actually is a um, hormone called ricin that the muscles, after I've been exercising, it's released from my muscles, and it makes more brown fat. And I need omega-3 to make more brown fat. I need to sleep to make more brown fat. I need to eat good fats to make brown fat. You know, so it, it is this amazing uh, continuing circle that helps in um, making sure that you are healthy. So I want more brown fat. All our life we wanted. Some studies said that, so we have it a lot, especially the first 10 years. And then it decreases. But hey, if I ate right, if I slept enough, if I exercised, I would keep that going and have enough for my life. And then by 60, somehow I get a rice again. Well, maybe because baby boomers is <laughs> taking care better right now. And it's like, oops, I'm getting old. <laughs> you know, I need to take care of myself. Then you see them at the gym, right? Uh, so maybe that's what brown fat, and then by 80, maybe we stop going to the gym. We should never stop, you know, we should never stop walking. And maybe that's when it's decreasing, and you see a lot of 80-year-olds, they're like, ooh, give me a sweater. Okay, so let's not go there. Let's keep that brown fat going. It, it, it's a funny thing. The more you, the, the more you study that, that we actually are, are totally self-made. I mean, we're, we, we can make so many things happen if we, if we knew, if we knew. And, you know, it, it's also what, it, when we eat and how we eat. Is, if, are we sitting in front of TV or computers when we eat? You know you will eat much more and you will snack forever because it just, it just induces that, you know. So uh, it, it's very important that when we eat, I always say, you know, our small intestine is affected by love and happiness. And um, 
if I have the opposite when I eat, which is small intestine, about 90% of your absorption into every cell in your body, so they're happy and they're, they can feed you and they can boost your immune system. 90% is happening in your small intestine. And if I have the opposite, if I have anxiety, if I have fear, if I have anger, I'm sure not going to digest what I ate. So, you know, it's very important that that happens. So shut that TV off. Shut the computers off. You owe yourself to eat in peace. And I think everybody, if you look at uh, your grandparents at least, they probably gave thanks and they probably gave attention to what they ate, and nobody ran to TV. Nobody ran to TV. That would have been outrageous, though. <laughs> okay, so there's many reasons why we gain weight, and I want to change this weight loss name so it gets into your mind, because it really is weight release. It's weight release, and it makes it makes it different, and just to put that in your mind, that that's what I want to do. I want to release some weight. And so what does it take to do that? And, you know, nowadays we have, we have a big problem with fatty livers. 20% of Americans have fatty livers. And some of you might never have heard about it until you go to the doctor and he says, you have a fatty liver. And, um, you know, Dr. Lustig, you, he's from University of California, and he uh, wrote a book, Fat Chance. Some of you might have read it, Fat Chance. And um, he really goes into that stress is the biggest part of why we actually get belly fat. And, but he's also talking about uh, fatty livers. And this is a big problem. And you would think, okay, that's for people that are alcoholics. And now a whole new generation that are n never touched alcohol. They're non-alcoholics are getting fatty livers. So what about the sugar? What about the processed fats that we were eating, the fried fats that we were eating? Big part of that poor liver having uh, problems. And of course, if I have a fatty liver, it often leads to cirrhosis and liver of cancer of the liver. So it's a process that happens. And... Um, we want to eat healthy fats. So here in UK, British Medical Journal did a study, and they found that, um, that um, they, they were exposing that fat, sugar and was the biggest culprit and for our explosion of, uh, of, um, of obesity. And they found the main thing was sodas. So we have fructose, dextrose, sucrose, it has so many names. And, you know, high fructose corn syrup has been in, uh, in sodas for so many years. We've been bombarded with this. And we've also been bombarded with opiates. They're synthetic opiate in such small amount, they're nanoparticles, they don't even have to be uh, shown in the ingredients. And imagine this, we've been on that, now they don't even call it high fructose corn syrup, they actually call it just fructose or fructose syrup. So if you read in future and you say, oh, they took out high fructose corn syrup, but no, it's probably there as under fructose. So this is a big problem. So they put number one for that. And a reason that they don't put high fructose corn syrup on the ingredients anymore, because if you read by, um, uh, Dr. Senef from MIT, she found that autism was totally linked to high fructose corn syrup with Roundup. And so Roundup is a pesticide that we have all absolutely have had in our food, unless you ate totally organic. So that, um, you know, there was, in the 1900s, there was this anti-fat campaign. So we sh everything should be low-fat. Low-fat milk, low-fat yogurt, low-fat cheese, low-fat everything. And you know that that actually led to inflammation, led to obesity, led to diabetes, led to cancer. Because now you totally denature the food. And, you know, just when you think about it, let's, let's say uh, cow's milk. You pasteurize it, you homo homogenize it, you heat it up to amazing uh, uh, he heat, and you kill just about everything in it. And 
That's what most of us were fed on. So how did we digest that? It mainly became sugar. Became sugar. And it made us fat. You see baby pictures of us, we were really plump. And you see baby pictures of kids now, especially on, on formulas, you know. They, it, it's just crazy. They, they, it takes them a long time to get their muscles in shape and, and um, get the baby fat off. So they're suffering. So, you know, a century ago, plants had so much. Our soil was so rich that everything you grew in it was, of course, amazing. I mean, we go to many countries and travel all over. This summer we traveled eight countries, and some of them were amazed that we told them, you have to buy organic. It didn't make sense to them that, what are you kidding yourself? You, you can't just go in a normal store and buy plants. You have to buy organic. You have to find a special store. It's just... It just went over their head that it actually happened, that this, this uh, change happened. So, but it's happened. So we all need to start growing things, and we can grow things in our house. This is the beauty of sprouts. We can grow a lot of food in our, sprout, in our house. So you take any seed, organic seed, and you, you soak it first, so you get rid of an enzyme inhibitor, and then you start life, and then you grow and you just rinse it morning and evening, you don't let it sit in water anymore. But, and there's many, many books about this, and of course at the Institute we teach this. The thing is that you are now getting live food, you're getting energy. You know, our body works on 75 hertz at ultimate, 75 hertz, our brain 80, 75, 85. But imagine this, this is so important that the frequency is getting in from my food. Because everything that's cooked has no frequency, has nothing, has, has no frequency, has no energy to give you at all. Okay. And so then you say, well, how did we survive that then? How, how did we? Well, poorly. We are have, having diseases that we didn't see even 50 years ago. What we see at our institute is children now with diseases that usually may be at 70, 80, or 90 years old. So we're paying a huge price. So I want to have foods that gives me life. You know, if you know, for example, so if I grow arugula, if I have a garden, I get five times more calcium than dairy, so that's dairy, it's God. And I have so many of other leafy greens that have calcium, that have good fat. They're called omega-3. There should be a balance between omega-6 and omega-9 uh, and, and 3. What happens, omega-3 and 6 should be one-to-one. -one. Now, because of our farming methods and our, our animal farming methods, and fish farming methods, we have a balance of 20 times more omega-6 to omega-3, leading to loads of problems, diseases, inflammations, cancer, you name it. So, so if I start growing sprouts, I'm going to have a good balance of omega-3 and omega-6. You never want to have an overabundance of omega-6, and cooked food will give you that, you know. So, Next one, we talk about oils. Okay, so now, in the early 1900s, we wanted to make oils that could sit forever, so they wouldn't get spoiled or rancid, okay? So we hydrogenated them. Hydrogenated means that we heat it up very, very high heat, and we add pesticides, probably, fertilizers, well, or the seeds had it, very cheap seeds that we started off with, and they're, most of them now is genetic manipulated, so then we make oils out of them. So please stay out of safflower and corn oil and oils that you think. If you don't know, don't buy it. You buy cold-pressed oils. And, you know, cold-pressed means it's not heated over a certain, like, 115 Fahrenheit or 42, 43 Celsius. That's the kind of oils. But you also have to realize when it comes to oils, it takes 40 pounds of olives to make a quart of olive oil. 40 pounds to, for one quart. So it's a concentrate. I can eat olives. I can eat seaweeds to get really good nourishment. And, you know, dolls, you hear about potassium. Dolls has like 25% more 
potassium than a banana. Because I know everybody knows about banana and potassium. Everybody I ask, where you could get potassium from, everybody will tell me, bananas. Yeah. Okay. Well, now that's a sugar. And some, some of you, bananas are okay. It depends on, you know, how we've been eating. For, from our point of view, when, when we teach people at our institute, a lot of people have problems where sugar is not a good thing. Because sugar, fructose, it's like any other sugar absorbed by your body. And the problem is that any virus bacteria, any fungus, any parasite, any cancer cell says, hooray, okay, give me more. So we don't want to feed them, and we take a break. Fruit will come back. We take a break. It depends on what, what, what the deal is for us. But maybe I take two years off. Maybe I don't need to take that long a time off. And maybe then when I start, I start with berries. So low, low glycemic, low, low sugary fruits, and you know, 15% of my diet can be fruit. So that might be where you're at. But you know, fruit is also for the morning. It helps you detoxify. So it really is not something you're gonna munch on all day, because the rest of the day you're building and you're nourishing totally different. So, and when you uh, hydrogenate oils, you really destroy the nourishment in it, you, the old, and especially the essential fatty acid. You can't make essential fatty acid. You know, you can't make vitamin C, right? There's a few things we can't make. You can't make essential fatty acid. You have to eat it every day. Hydrogenated oils, it's gone. So you destroyed it. And um, it's a big part. So no more of the, those oils. If you have them in your cupboard, pour them over plants outside, they'll be happy. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, and then uh, recycle the bottle. Okay, now look at fish. And this is the question. Who thought of squeezing oil out of a fish so we could get omega-3? It's, really it's, it's a really crazy idea. So we take the whole fish and we squeeze the oil out of it so we can get omega-3. <laughs> so, you know, but we kind of take it for granted because especially for cardiovascular, we've been bombarded with this information that it's going to help you and uh, so prevent heart attack and strokes. No, of course this is rancid, terrible, terrible idea. And so if I want oils, I get non-hydrogenated oils and I don't eat a lot of these things. I will eat them in moderation. And uh, so, not, not please don't have your whole salad swim in that, because <laughs> you waste it, and you want to get good stuff, and it's expensive in the long run. So, sprouts is a good uh, alternative, and wild plants, anything, oh, you can also buy dandelion, but of course, if I can pick dandelion in my garden, if I can pick nettles, and all the edible plants, they have amazing omega-3. So, purslane, has eight times more than, uh, than fish oil. Eight times more, imagine. I mean, it's a great, great source of omega-3. And, um, you know, you're, uh, when you go for plant source, and I know all of you probably are from plant source, and I hope a lot of the audience here is on a vegan diet or on their way to start a vegan diet, which is, Absolutely, if you are worried about the environment, that is the way to go. So there's a lot of roads that lead to Rome, right? And so if I'm worried about environment, because the biggest source of environmental hazard is animal food eating consumption, and we, we can't keep doing it. And like World Health Organization said a while ago that it's not sustainable, there is we have to find other ways. Well, we already know what other ways, you know. Like our institute for 60 years have been teaching and teaching this and have seen the results. And we still, we see it every day when people change, even in 21 days. Like we do blood tests the first week and the third week. It's just amazing how willing your body is to change when it gets the right fats, the right protein, and it gets it in a live form. It is, 
it's just so beautiful to see. Cholesterol drops like 50 points, it's a no-brainer. High blood pressure comes down slowly but surely because you're cleaning the arteries, all that plaque you build up from all the wrong proteins and fats and sugar. Of course, sugar is the biggest problem as we're all sugar addicts. It turns to fat, you know? So it builds up our white fat and we get more and more obese. So it's, um, it's a lot to do with plant-based, organic. Of course, I want to be organic. I want to be or biodynamic or organic, wherever you live in the world. Um, I ran a clinic in, outside Stockholm and we bought from a biodynamic farm. And it was amazing. Everything we had was tasting and people would come and say, I never tasted this like this. The lettuce, the cucumbers, the, the um, celery, and whatever we used from them, it was, it was just amazing. And, um, you know, it's the microbes in the soil that is so important for it to be nourishing for all of us. So soil, of course, it comes down to the soil for all of us. And if you come from countries where you haven't uh, expose the soil to so much of commercial farming, you know how much better food tastes. I know a lot of places in Sweden where the food still tastes amazing. And uh, we're actually working with a man from Long Island that has nourished the soil so much that his produce, it blows your mind. He came with a watermelon one day. And you know how heavy a watermelon is? You pick it up. His was double as heavy, same size of what, a double. It was so full of nourishment and the flavors, it was like, wow, we were just screaming. It was so amazing. And he has realized that you nourish the soil, you get the produce, you get the nourishment. So, and you want everything fresh. Of course, if I now go to the supermarket, it took many weeks sometimes for it to get there. So please, go to farmer's market where the, these wonderful people probably picked it up the day before and they sell it the next day or they picked it up the same morning. That's when you get good nourishment and then you add the sprouts you grew or somebody grew for you. Because there are sprout growers in a lot of places. Wheatgrass is an enormous source. Wheatgrass juice, we cannot eat wheatgrass. We need four stomachs, right? We only have one. <laughs> So wheatgrass juice is like a blood transfusion. It is so rich in nourishment and protein. It is a complete food. So if you haven't tried wheatgrass juice yet, go and try it. Go to the local uh, juice bar, give it a try. Try maybe one ounce first. We, we suggest two ounces twice a day. And uh, it's a blood builder. It's amazing. And of course we make green juices out of sprouts like sunflower sprouts and pea sprouts and we put celery cucumber leafy greens parsley kale dandelions collard greens whatever you can find in your part of the world a lot of times i in sweden i put nettles i put uh, the little leaves the little green shoots from pine trees and um, pine needles not too much it doesn't make too nice a juice but you know whatever i can add i can add cabbage so you have to be flexible. Wherever you live, you might not have exactly what we have here. Then it comes to microbes. So if there's good microbe in the soil and I'm eating good food, then I'm going to have a good microbe flora. I'm going to have a, an, an amazing immune system because more, most of my immune system comes from my gut. Little did we know here, it comes from here. So when my gut is happy, I'm happy because I make a lot of serotonin. That's the happy juice. And serotonin makes melatonin. That's my sleep juice. Then I sleep good too. So, you know, the thing is that, that, um, I was going to say, it took me off. That, okay. So there was a study here that I think it's the next one. McDonald's, okay, so now this King's College in England, London, did this study. What happens if I eat McDonald's, could be any of the fast food restaurants, for 10 days? What happens to our my gut microbes? Third was gone. A third was gone in 10 days. 
Well, that means now inflammation, diseases, I mean, it's just all waiting to walk in. So that is a big, big danger. And imagine, uh, you know, what is McDonald's and what are the fast food giving us? They're giving us trans fats, they're giving us sugar, and they're, they like to give us, uh, you know, meat, dairy, eggs, of course. And, you know, counting calories doesn't work, dieting doesn't work, but just look at a meal at McDonald's, yeah, so it kills a third of your um, microbes in, in 10 days. The thing is that it also, uh, you know, is giving you foods that you can't really digest and you will just pour on extra weight. So, now, the next one is um, about how much we eat in, um, in um, yeah, here, how much we eat in uh, an un unhealthy saturated fats, and, and really, that unhealthy saturated fats we're going to get from meat and dairy and fish and, and all of that. And there is a trend right now that a lot of people goes for eggs. They're telling me, I'm totally vegan, but I have eggs. <laughs> well, that's not eat. And I even have to explain to people that eggs are an animal and that would become a chicken. Are you kidding? <laughs> so <laughs> it's really a funny thing. What did you think an egg really was? And it's in the dairy uh, section, so I think most people think it must be like cheese and butter. It's just the one more thing of that. So now, let's go for things that can block and why we not um, metabolize food as well. Our thyroid, our thyroid sits right here. It looks like a, a butterfly. And, you know, we make iodine from, we get iodine from a lot of food, especially seaweeds, and especially food that's grown in soil that has iodine. Most soil today, especially um, factory farms, there, the soil is um, so depleted in iodine, and a lot of people have underactive thyroid. There is a way to protect your thyroid, because we are all bombarded with radiation. We've had Chernobyl, and being Swedish, Sweden got really bad hit because it rained the day Chernobyl happened, and, and that was only one reactor, Fukushima is three reactors. So, you know, we only have one atmosphere. We might think that we're not a part of this uh, radioactive uh, elements that comes into our life, but we, we are. We need to have iodine. We get it from potassium iodide. We mainly get it from seaweeds, it, table salts. They took everything away. You know, salt is either pink or gray, but they wanted fancy salt in the 1970s, so it should be white. Okay, so they took everything out of it, and, and the same, same clo uh, chloride and sodium. So, and now they're adding iodine. Since long time, they've been adding iodine. But guess what? That iodine evaporates as soon as you open that jar. So you think you're getting iodine from that salt? Forget it. You need to get it. And sometimes you have to take it from maybe a supplement too to get in a better position. But if your thyroid is full of iodine, you are protected from radioactive iodine that you would get from Chernobyl, Fukushima and other things, you know. So let's say now that I have to have CAT scans and I PET scans, whatever scans you have to do for whatever reason, you better fill yourself with iodine so I have protection. Because this is the most sensitive gland to radiation. And this is why Look at Chernobyl, what do we get? Fukushima, all the tons of kids now in Fukushima close by are getting thyroid cancer, right? So we see this a big deal. We see this as a big deal. And if you have kids, feed them seaweeds like dolls, like kombu, like wakame, like arame, like um, nori. And, you know, there's a lot of nice things you can do with nori sheets and just wrap your salad in there. We used to have to do that for our kids. Our kids are brought up this way. By the way, we have now the seventh grandkid coming in December. 
It's grown since. <laughs> so, you know, whenever they got tired of the same salad, we just, okay, throw it into a nori wrap, well, fine, you know. And uh, there are other sprouted wraps, too, that you can help. And, you know, a lot of children do come with their parents to our institute, and it's not easy. The first couple of days, it's like they look at it like, will I ever be able to eat anything here? And then, then, we, then we barter with them, we make them chia pudding, which is just chia seed, which is complete protein, omega-3, all the good stuff. But we add a little bit of um, lemon and vanilla flavor. And, you know, if you need sweetener, you use stevia, which is a natural sweetener. It's in the family of licorice, it's not sugar sugar. And we make dehydrated pizzas, and we make them kelp noodles. If you never had that, boy, you got to come to the Institute. We have it. <laughs> kelp noodles, so great for you, and they, everybody loves it. And so we barter with them, and, and before you know it, it's like, okay, I can do this. So to dehydrate, of course, a lot of uh, liquid fluid is taken out, but it, we still consider it a live food that will help you in your journey of getting back to health. So soy, gluten, fluoride blocks iodine. So I don't want to have soy and gluten if I have a poor thyroid, for sure. Soy and gluten. Gluten, I mean, I was brought up on gluten. I thought it was the best thing ever. And you know what? It actually has an opium effect on your brain. That's why you eat that bowl of pasta and you're like, yes. <laughs> and then you pay for it because it's just sugar for you. And, and that flour is just nothing. You know, flour, everything is taken out of flour. At least in old days, we ground our own flour and made the bread right away. Now flour is sitting on your shelf, what, half a year? Before you use it, you know it's dead. It's nothing to it. And gluten is a huge factor of why we have gastrointestinal problems. You know, so a lot of kids are are suffering from that. This uh, is American uh, Journal. It's uh, let me see. It's the Physiology and the Chronology and um, Metabolism um, Journal, and they. They stated this, that animal, the effect of animal diet is the same as chronic stress. So there is an axis, it's called hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis in the brain, and animal diet was the same as chronic stress. It's pretty scary when you think about it. So you can start to see how your immune system is affected of all of this. And, you know, media is funded by the um, dairy and meat industry. So they're not going to let you know these things. They're not going to write about these things. And talking to journalists that would like to, in many magazines, would like to write things, like write about what we're doing here, Real Truth About Health, the Institute, and many, many others that are speaking here. They're like, ah, because advertisers are the meat and dairy industry. You can't go against them, and this would actually go against. So a lot of times, we're not getting our voice heard. And um, we had a journalist come to us a few months ago, and she was so excited. Her best friend came through our program. She came back, she looked like a million bucks. She's like, I want to see this place. And she came. And she made the interview, and, and she said, I'm coming back, this is so, so amazing. The day she wanted to send it out, they took it off. That day, she called and said, I'm not allowed. <clears throat> so we thank God for Stephen Shore. Let's give Stephen Shore an applaud. Because we have a voice, and you know, hopefully thousands and thousands and tens of thousands will hear about how we really, the, the truth about health, how we really were supposed to live, and how we can take care of each other, because we kind of have this sense that, you know, suit yourself, find your way yourself, and that's not fair, because there's a lot of us that have information and that could guide you, but if we don't get a voice heard, you're, you're just going to look in every book, and there is a lot, it's a jungle when it comes to books. It's this diet and that diet, and then now it's this fate, and, you know, and it, it turns pathetic after a while, and then you're like, you give up, you give up. So this is um, 
just to say that animal fat is like chronic stress. That is, uh, that's big time. And, um, you know, omega-3, that brown fat that we need so, so much more as we get older, especially, we, omega-3 stimulates it. So when I'm eating vegetables with omega-3, I'm eating that personally. I'm eating my arugula, my, my sprouts, my seaweed, you know, Avocado, of course, is amazing, omega-3. And nuts, my walnuts, it's the, it's the largest of omega-3. But the only nuts we don't use are peanuts and cashew. They tend to have this fungus, the aflatoxin, that could be a carcinogen. So, but all the others are amazing. And the best way to eat them is to soak them overnight first. Then you get much more out of it. So we want to... Um, it's good to know how to deal with uh, the foods and where do we get them from. Omega-3, because I think probably a lot of you thought it's fish oil. It's got to be fish oil, because especially now with the autism spectrum, everybody's taught it's got to be fish oil. It's not true, you know. It is really, really not the way. And you will also hear that the omega-3 that you get from plant source is not adequate. It's not enough. And that's so not true. And you know who paid for that. You should know that every research is paid by somebody. It's news just came out the other day about one scientist that did 75 research and they were all fake. So imagine how many of these research we have read and believed, and they were all fake. They just made it up. And, you know, not to say that research, there are research that are true, but you know who paid for most of them. If, if it comes out about coffee, you know the coffee industry paid. If chocolate is suddenly so good that we are, yo, it's the best thing ever, you know that the chocolate <laughs> industry paid for it. it. It's just the way it is. So sometimes we just have to wake up and see that. And here comes, of course, about diabetes and, you know, how this really happened. And that fat decreases the glucose uptake. Okay, so I can't take it up in my tissue. It's actually as a block in my tissue. And um, there's, uh, we have to eat, we have to eat fat. We have to eat go good essential fat to, to make it. So we work with a lot of people with diabetes. There is, there's three kinds of diabetes. You might not have heard about the third. The, the, of course, the number two is when it's, you're not making enough insulin, and that's just lifestyle. That's when we screwed up so much. We've been eating wrong fats, wrong sugars, and high amount and non-nutritious food. And then what happens is one day we can't make enough insulin. Well, then we have number one, we just don't make enough. And the funny thing is now, in the old days, you were usually born with it or would show up very early in, in life. Now it shows up often when you're 30, 40 years old. And you're like, how is this possible that you can have diabetes type one? Isn't it type 2? A lot of physicians are confused too. How is this possible? Well, we have denatured food so much that it's, that it's just gone so far that we just can't make enough insulin. So with diabetes type 2, we kind of keep, keep a little bit, and with medication, we can keep it. Well, diabetes type 3 is in the brain. And this is for Alzheimer come. You know that one out of nine that's over 65 in US has Alzheimer. And one out of nine. And there will be an explosion. That is totally predictable because diabetes is gonna explode and Alzheimer goes with it big time. But it's not, it's like the diabetes type three, because you need insulin for the brain to function. So if I eat too much sugar, I'm going to deplete that too. My memory is going to go. And, uh, you know, it's, what they find is that the neurons get all um, uh, messed up. Instead of functioning and, and communicating, it's, it's a mess. And um, when they looked at MRIs, you know, they can actually see. You can actually see if you do iridology, you can see when calcification happens. There is um, 
if you look at the iris, there actually often will be like a white circle around your iris. And that doesn't mean you're going to get Alzheimer. That means you better take care. You better start eating live foods. Get on a plant-based diet, get on an organic diet, and you can clean up a lot of things. I don't mean that if I have had Alzheimer's for years that I'm going to suddenly be cured, but what if I prevent it from happening? So you can actually check your own eyes, too. So uh, weight uh, lowers interferon. Interferon is your immune protector. Okay? If I want to attack a virus, bacteria, or cancer cells, I need interferon. That's the killing mechanism. And, and it's all about communication in my body. So looking at blood, I looked at blood under with, with the microscope for 20 years. It is a world of its own, and it's absolutely magic. If you didn't believe in God before, you believe in God when you look at what's going on inside your blood. And that is just like a little picture of what's going on in your whole system. So you have red blood cells, white blood cells. You have different kinds of white blood cells that do different, that have, I call them different agents. They have different jobs. And lymphocytes is a big part. They have T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes. <clears throat> They're a big part of taking care of infections, making sure that they're like the generals. They make sure you don't get an infection. And sometimes you do. Sometimes emotionally you're being depressed or too, life has just have been too traumatic or I haven't slept enough or I worked too hard and whatever happened. Or I didn't eat, I didn't drink enough, whatever happened. So, you know, they're there to protect you. But it's sometimes they're just busy with all the junk we ate or not sleeping and trying to create balance. They found, even with Alzheimer, that if they could add lymphocytes, especially T lymphocytes, to somebody, because Alzheimer is not just the diabetes tree that I talked about. It is an immunological problem. And so if we're looking only to change their diet because of, uh, of diabetes or because we want to nourish them more, we have to look at their whole immune system. And guess what? The latest thing now is high blood pressure, hypertension, huge. So they're thinking if we could get rid of their high blood pressure, 25% of dementia would be gone. Imagine that. High blood pressure. So now we know we need to boost their immune system. We need to get rid of high blood pressure. So now this is telling you, how can I prevent Alzheimer? Well, I don't want, if I have high blood pressure, I want to do everything to get rid of it. And medication is not a cure. Medication is just, you know, taking the signals away. So medication you can keep if you need it, but one day maybe your physician will say, you know, you're doing so well, maybe we can lower it and maybe slowly but surely decrease it. So uh, the whole thing is that we, we all are heading for a lot of things. Our brain, our brain is uh, shrinking every, uh, every year after we're 40. <laughs> and it shrinks 5% after we're 40. But we can change that. If we change lifestyle, we change that. But it's actually shrinking. So there's a lot to the brain. We don't want to lose it, right? 5% is 40, you know? Imagine, you just count where you're at now if you had. <laughs> so, you know, the thing is, yeah, you have a brain. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> but it's shrinking. And, you know, of course, the only way we would know these things is that we would do an MRI and, and check. And, and um, yeah, but it's, uh, there's, so much, there's so much science out there. And I always say every day, they're coming this way. They just don't know it. But everything that they find tells them that Animal food consumption didn't work. That's passé. Dairy is passé. The sodas is passé. All these sodas, that, and sodas could be fruit sodas, could be um, 
uh, uh, iced tea, could be the sports drinks, you know, all of that is high fructose, uh, or whatever they call it, but it's still high, high sugar. So let's drink water. If you want, you put some stevia and some lemon, shake it up, put some cayenne in there, keep you warm all day, and you, you make your own things. Make your own things at home in the morning and then bring them to work or to school. We have packed for our kids all their life. It's just what you do. <laughs> That's how we roll. <laughs> so you pack in the morning, pack their water or their lemonade, and they like a lot of stevia. And then uh, stevia is very sweet. It's really, really sweet, so you only need a few drops, but they like a lot. And then you pack sprouts, seaweeds. I, I soak and sprout uh, sunflower seeds I put into the dehydrator and fix them up with spices, whatever spices you like and, um, you know, have that, have avocado, have hummus. There's no limit what you can do when you go to the plant life. There is really a limit when you eat meat and potato. You know, a lot of people say, what do you eat if you don't have animal foods? Because, you know, that's where you should get protein and calcium from. Well, remember, that is just brainwashing since about 100 years. So, you know, our parents, our grandparents, they have heard that. And so it's a big part of, of what uh, we were taught. And if you look at us compared to carnivore, <clears throat> you know, we have flat molars. They have sharp, sharp molars and they have sharp fangs. And we have a very long intestinal tract, about six times long. An animal, a carnivore only has double their size. And they have loads of hydrochloric acid because you need that when you eat raw meat. And we have very little hydrochloric acid. We're absolutely meant to be a plant eater. That's how we were created. And, you know, time, time will show as people more and more become plant eaters how much healthier everybody will be and how much healthier animals will be as we do not eat them anymore. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we don't need any animal to give us their meat. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so, here's the picture. <laughs> you know, and... Uh, the whole thing is, this is uh, going into uh, fight or flight response, and which is this response where adrenal, adrenals make cortisol. And cortisol is making us really strong. And not only do we make that, we make adrenaline, we make also co cholesterol. And it makes us super women and men. And now I can lift up. I mean, if I found something really, really heavy and I had to lift it in a hurry, I would be able to lift it. If I had to run faster than fast, I would be able to run faster than fast. And even if I was sleepy right now, I could be really like just taking a nap and you said, fire, and I would run. I would have that, that adrenaline and that cortisol. I would have that. Now what happened, I wear out. If I'm in chronic stress, I wear out my cortisol, and now I get into that chronic fatigue, which, you know, so many people have. So we were supposed to be able to fight anything. We, we had this response. So imagine when every day we're finding that I'm responding the same way. I have so much stress. That, and you know when you have that, you're not going to sleep well, you're not going to eat well, because there is a hormone called leptin, that appetite uh, stimulator, and it's just have, or I would say stimulator, balancer, I should say. But that one now is reduced. So that's supposed to kind of give us a good appetite. Well, that's now so reduced, now I can eat all I want. I can eat all day long. I am hungry. So I am not going to really go to the bathroom, so constipation happened. And my libido go down the drain because, you know, that's just on the back burner for sure when I have that stress. And a lot of people, that is one, Brian and I wrote a book about uh, seven um, ways to improve your sexual vitality. And uh, we wrote that because we get this question all day long from men and women, how do I improve my sexual vitality? 
food, exercise, sleep, yes, but how do we really work with this stress that we had in our life? So, you know, we'll come to that because there's, there's so many good rules. Well, belly fat, this is uh, the most stubborn of all, right? And you know, if I look like this as a man and a woman, if I'm a man, you know your testosterone is low and you know your estrogen is high. Now, if, if I look like that and my estrogen is high as a man, what do I have now? I'm getting into trouble with prostate cancer and many other forms, but especially prostate cancer. So I now have low testosterone. And then maybe I go to a doctor and I get testosterone. Yeah, is that really going to help me when this is screaming much more than low testosterone? I need to change my whole lifestyle. So, you know, testosterone is very important. It makes your blood, it makes your bones strong. So it's very important, and men and women have it. But if I look like this, I've been eating food that upped my estrogen. This is a big part. If I look like this as a woman, I for sure have high estrogen, and that is feeding my breast cancer now. That would definitely feed breast cancer. And so, uh, so many men and women are suffering this. So, you know, um, you can read about, a lot about that also in, in Dr. Lustig. So here comes everybody's favorites. There's the chocolate, the coffee, and you know, the teas. And it's just skyrocket cortisol produced production. And um, what it does, it, it actually uh, it makes adrenal stress even worse. So now I'm eating chocolate because I'm stressed, and it makes it worse. So I might not see it uh, like uh, the first, you know, when I'm just eating. I was brought up on Swedish chocolate. And my best way was uh, to, uh, to get rid of it forever, was to uh, go to a chocolate factory in, outside Stockholm and got a bag full of chocolate that all of us kids, I was just little, ate on the way in the bus home and got sicker than sick, and I don't want to see a chocolate ever again. <laughs> So, maybe that's your cure, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, there's constant research showing that, oh, chocolate and caffeine, there's caffeine and chocolate. And that coffee, I mean, we have Starbucks, we have all kinds of shops that are drug pushers of caffeine. And, you know, it's not even a small amount, it's a huge amount. And it comes with dairy, and it comes with sugar, and it comes with all kinds of fancy stuff. And we stuff ourselves. And uh, you can go all over the world now, and you see these shops. And uh, so that's the real, that's one of the biggest uh, uh, drug pushers you can find. So if you're leading into those kind of, of stores, then move uh, into uh, stores that have good water and good juices, fresh juices for you to, um, to again. Then we get to the brain again. So, you know, 60% of your brain is fat. And there is fats in food that are totally identical. And the main ones are blue-green algae, the green algaes, and um, so we use blue-green algae as a big part that we use, and you can find it just about everywhere to buy now, and uh, we, every, every student that comes through our program, uh, we suggest to take blue-green algae. Our kids have had it all their life, and um, you know, it's really, really important to feed our brain to, and we need a daily intake of good fats. And what you see is that there's communi communication from nerve cell to nerve cell. And uh, there is, um, there's a chem there, it's done by neurotransmitters, and there is a chemical that's called prostaglandin that keeps this communication going. And it needs these nutrients, it needs the B vitamins and to function good. So the hair comes again. I need to take my B12. A lot of the other B vitamins I do get from live sprouts and vegetables and seeds and grains and nuts and all that. But I do not get 
enough of B12, so I need to take that. So that's one we definitely suggest that you, uh, you get. And these uh, prostaglandins uh, help you with your memory, your imagination, and uh, it's very, very important. So then you have uh, the vitamin A, B, C, D, E, and all the fiber and all the minerals that are so important to, uh, to nourish you and it actually regulates your hormones. So a lot of times we wonder, why do I have hormonal imbalance? And a lot of men and women say, you know, how come I don't have energy? How come my hormones are off? I need nourishment for my hormone. I need to exercise to have good hormonal balance. So what happens, for example, as a woman when we go through menopause? Well, you guys go through andropause much earlier too. But, you know, what's, what happens to us in that time? Do we, have to, do we have to take hormones? Yeah, some women need it maybe from their lifestyle and maybe they need it in the, in the time of shift. And do we really need it? Did women need it a thousand years ago? No. <laughs> we, we moved. You know, we are human beings on two legs. We have this body. We have the head on top. We're supposed to walk miles and miles every day. And when we don't, our hormones suffer. When we don't get nutrition from our food, our hormones suffer. So it really comes down to getting more. And supplementation, if it's from a plant source, if it's alive, if it's you know, from a good source that, we're, that soil has been good, like seaweed, of course, blue-green algae, chlorella, the green algae, then go for it. You know, we take extra enzymes. We take uh, also glutathione, which is amazing to protect your mitochondria, which is every energy in every cell in your body. And you, you can take that. You can take extra uh, minerals. What, what about if I have uh, now mercury poisoning? Take selenium. You know, there's a problem with metals. And that is that they can become a part of your nourishment need. But if I don't have enough of nourishment, let's say everything I ate, I didn't have enough zinc, selenium, magnesium, then heavy metals come in, take advantage. Like mercury looks like a familiar mineral, a familiar element. And if I'm lacking selenium, it'll be my selenium. Imagine that. And it goes on and on and on. So a lot of people have toxicity like that. And if I start nourishing myself, not only am I helping my hormones, I'm helping to clean up heavy toxins. We also go into saunas to clean up. I just sat in the sauna today again. Nobody knows why they're sitting in the sauna. They're fully dressed. They have their gym shoes on. And they're sweating like a pig. And they're like, I, this is too hot. And I'm like, yeah, you have nylon clothes on, which is terrible. And you should take a shower after this. You should take a hot and cold shower. Oh, I didn't know. You know, that it's like, why am I in the sauna? Because it's a help to detoxify toxins. And, uh, you know, it, it's a wonderful tool. We use far infrared saunas at the Institute. We have uh, like 12 of them. And... We suggest every guest to use time. Far infrared is not as hot as the normal uh, Finnish Swedish saunas, and uh, they heat you from the inside out. But any sauna, any sauna is fine. And that is a, an old tool in all kinds of traditions. People have heated their body temperature up to kill infections too. Because what is a fever? Your body heats up, kills, and in a few days, you're fine. You made antibodies for the infections, and you're fine. And the more, actually, that you've been fighting infections as a child, uh, if you were brought up on a good diet, a healthy diet, healthy lifestyle, the more you fought infection, the more antibodies you have stored. It's like having a bank. The more antibodies I have stored, the stronger, the healthier I'm going to be for the rest of my life. So it's really, you know, it's amazing because what happens, we have overused antibiotic. <clears throat> and, you know, we've been eating. I mean, there's like 30 million pounds a year is put into animals. So imagine how much antibiotic everybody's eating. So we're, 
we're eating it and then we get immune to it. And, but it's causing havoc because, especially for the younger generation, and the, the more we had antibiotic as a child, and it happens, but especially if it's long term, it is um, a problem with obesity as we get older. So it is actually shown to be, to actually be one of the causes of obesity for a lot of kids because we've used. So we got to use antibiotic with, with, um, sparingly when it's needed keep it for when it's needed and of course if i'm not eating animal products i am not immune to it but all the kids now that are brought up on a lifestyle where it's been such a big part they're more or less immune and this is a danger because it's going to take a while before we go from one lifestyle to the next i think people are going to have to wean off and we're all addicts, so it's going to be weaning. It's going to take time. And for hopefully organic farmers be growing and growing in every little town and, you know, support them because this is what we need. If you have any garden, when you go to Europe, we were in Lithuania, nobody is just having grass. Every little inch they have of property around the house is full of plants, fruit trees and gardens. And so here we have time to do grass and we have to put pesticides and Roundup and we have to use tons of water. We get nothing out of it. And, you know, so it's really crazy. I wish we could do it at the Institute, but when you have a place, we do have a farm uh, that is beautiful, but just, you know, I wish we could just plant food everywhere, but you can, and, and you can also plant a lot of things hydroponic in your apartment. If you don't have a garden, you can grow things hydroponic. There are hydroponic machines that of automatic, you just get a plumber to fix it on and you can grow so many things in there. Hydroponic means that I'm not getting trace minerals, but then I can add seaweeds and good foods like that. So, so sprouts, so this, uh, the NPR realized that 50% of us are chronically stressed. 50%, imagine that. And this Carnegie Mellon University that they found that it actually compromises the body's ability to um, regulate dangerous inflammation. Imagine. Then University of Minnesota came out with a study that shows that exercise, when it comes to estrogen, it breaks it down to less harmful, uh, 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 safer component. And not only could it prevent breast cancer, because that was the study, but it could even help with recurrence, you know. So exercise helped to break down the estrogen to, um, to uh, non-dangerous components. Imagine that. So now you want to exercise. Now you want to take a walk after this. <laughs> and then all major diseases greatly Greatly uh, sources f fuel from uh, lifestyle and the, and the information that they cost, because it's all about information. If you eat vitamins and minerals from life sources, they come in with information. If it's cooked and processed, they don't come in with much information except take care of me, I can't take care of you. <laughs> and that is not a good thing. So. Oh, yeah, well, and we eat emotionally, and, you know, we know that, and, and uh, now we get to this. So we have, you know, attitude and stress, right? How the attitude about ourself and, and our, our self-image is huge. And clean, nutritious, organic, plant-based diet, exercise, stretching. So what we propose is that you eat at least a 80% raw food diet, 20% plant-based could be um, cooked or treated, of course, not fried. We don't use any oils for cooking. No matter what you hear, that, he that oils can be heated. No oils can be heated. It's a carcinogen when you heat them, okay? So there's no oil that you should heat. 
and you can steam, you can get steamers, and meditation and prayer, and just to alter your stress. We have a uh, therapy that's so popular, it's called Nucom, and that really helps to alter your stress, and all our guests get to uh, try this, and it's been amazing, and um, then um, having exercise. Now, having uh, aerobic exercise is really, like I told you, there is actually a hormone called ricin that the muscle fiber releases that helps you to uh, make more brown fat. And brown fat burns fat, burns calorie. And that's, so that's what I want. And uh, sleep well, you know, it's a lot of things that will help you to get there. Food is a huge part. So I want to have stretching seven times, a, yeah, seven times a week, every day, five to 10 minutes. And you know, if you take a walk, don't you just stretch on a tree? I mean, you do some stretching, I hope, because if I don't stretch, I'm gonna get really stiff. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna be able to do things. I can't play with my grandkids and, you know, it's, uh, I want to keep vital, I want to keep myself moving. And um, aerobics five times a week for like 35 minutes. So when, if you are in the gym and you go on the elliptical, you go 35 minutes. Or you take a good brisk walk for 35 minutes at least. Of course, it can be much longer. I love long walks. And, you know, if you realize we were supposed to walk miles and miles, that takes you a while then. So it depends on, you might have to find a park close by that works for you. And, um, you know, weight training three times a week, you, you spend an hour or two. All right, we're coming to the end. Oh, there's something in between there. Okay, well, I will tell you. So, now we have some other therapies. We do IVs. One is called uh, MIC-12, which is methione, inositol, and uh, choline, and we add B12 to that, and that helps weight loss. So a lot of people choose to get a IV like that to help. And then we have this um, non-invasive radiofrequency laser, and that can actually sculpt you. So it can sculpt your body, your face, very popular. And of course, the saunas are great hyperbaric. Have you ever been in a hyperbaric? It's heaven. Uh, you lay in the hyperbaric and it oxygenates you and it really helps with weight loss. And that is actually approved for wound healing. And you can just look at, if I need to lose weight, that kind of is my wound. <laughs> so it's a good thing for you to do. So last but not least, you know, I've been working with this for more than 40 years and see so many people being successful. And I don't think there's anybody, if you really have your mindset and you really commit yourself to a better lifestyle, that you're not going to be successful. Absolutely. And hopefully you've learned some tonight or today, uh, wherever you are in the world, to be more interested in what you ate and, and how you can use it for your success and have a long, healthy life. Thank you. Mm.